Are you a military service member or veteran struggling with insomnia? A new study is investigating a non-drug therapy program that you can receive from your computer or a smartphone. If you find it difficult to fall or stay asleep or feel tired throughout the day, internet-guided cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia may be a treatment worth exploring. If you or a loved one is a current or former military service member, has had a head injury, and are between the ages of 18 and 64, you might qualify for this study. Call or text 301-456-5474 or head on over to militaryveterandad.com forward slash sleep. Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back. This is episode 156 of Military Veteran Dad, and I've got a dad joke to kick us off here today on this Monday morning. How do you follow Will Smith in the snow? Awkward silence, deepening the pause. You follow the fresh prince. I know, you don't need to thank me. That was so good. You're probably laughing in your car because you're like, man, I can't believe he just went there with that dad joke. And yes, I did just go there. But to get to some serious questions and topics, let's dive into our topic today. And the question I want to kick you off with to prepare you for this episode is, what will we leave behind? Now, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, this is going to be essentially the giant theme of what we talk about in this podcast is what we leave behind, our legacy, our wisdom, who we are, all these things combined together. If you've been a longtime listener, this will just be another thread in the tapestry of legacy and helping you understand a different way to do it and intentional and even more so to make sure that your wisdom is something that's passed down from generation to generation. Our guest, Alan Carter, started a habit of writing his kids a letter each month in their teenage years. The letters cover an amazing array of life lessons that also show an intimate glimpse of one's family life and journey. All families, the same challenges, and in this connection that makes the book endearing and relevant to all who read it. Christian faith and values are highlighted throughout, and our conversation today goes into those areas as well, and stories from the Bible are brought to life. If you want to support the podcast, check out this link on the show notes for Letters from a Father, where you can grab your copy of these letters that he wrote to his teenagers. This episode is going to be one that I think hopefully inspires you to dream bigger, but then also Realize how intentional you can be with something as simple as writing a letter a month and have a lasting impact on your family well beyond your time above the dirt. And whether you're under the dirt or above the dirt with your time here on earth, your wisdom will be passed on, your memories, how you thought, how you lived. And we're only forgotten as a veteran when no one remembers our name. And this is a great way to make sure that someone always remembers your name, who you were, and how you lived. If you want to hear my big takeaway of this podcast, hang on to the other side. Otherwise, let's get started with today's episode on Alan Carter and Letters from a Father. Today, I'm talking with Alan Carter, the author of Letters from Father, and he is already an amazing guy because we've been talking for the last 20 minutes before we hit record, so I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. He's dialing in from North Georgia, but he is a Chicago native, so he's just south of where I am here in Wisconsin. Welcome to the podcast, Alan. Hey, so good to be here, Ben. Thanks for having me today. I'm going to put a PSA in this episode that we are both going to have a hard time not just falling in love with this episode because you're passionate about fatherhood. I'm passionate about fatherhood and you're what I'm probably going to be almost selfish with. You're at the end of your seasons of fatherhood. So like you already have the notes and blueprints for like, don't cross that off. It doesn't work. That thing actually leads to this. So you want to avoid that thing. So I'm probably going to ask you a lot of questions because my kids are all under nine. So they're nine, seven and five. So you have access to information that I need to know. Oh, Ben, I don't know about that, but I got to tell you, someone asked me last week, hey, it's like, hey, man, this empty nest thing must be super lonely and you guys must be suffering. And I was like looking at my wife, I'm going, this is awesome. <laughs> it's not that we didn't like having our kids in the home. We love them so much, but 
what a great chapter we're embarking in now. And frankly, I'm ready for a break. <laughs> well, let's actually go there. You teed it up for a perfect segue, whether you realize it or not, that that moment that you just said with your wife is not the norm that a lot of people reach the empty nest and it's the opposite. They reach a part where they're with their relationship with their spouse and they're like, I don't really know you and I don't really understand how we got here. And I think we're two different people now. And sometimes they completely drift apart. So I would like to, before we even dive into fatherhood, what are some of the things that you did well in your busy life to make sure that you stayed best friends, that you stayed knowing each other and that you never got the priorities backwards? No, it's a great question. I'll give you a cap. I don't know that I've done anything right, but I can tell you what's worked for us. And I'll back up and just to say, you know, what you described is not at all unusual because you spend 18 years, right, focused on each child. And if you've got multiple kids, we had three. I mean, it's like 27 years of our life that we're completely focused on the children in the house. And that's as it should be. But all of a sudden, when that door closes and your last kid drives away, there's crickets chirping, right? So you've got to reconnect then at a different level because all of a sudden it isn't about the kids. You know, my mantra has always been that, hey, if, if I can have mentally putting my wife first and me second, that's a darn good place to start. And I think that's really, really worked well for both of us. My wife, Mary, God bless her. She's put up with me. She has that same thought process. And I had that same process. So it really works well for us. Did you both work or did one stay home? Mary stayed home. So we were blessed with that. That was our decision. I know it's not for every family. We felt it was right for us. But frankly, that made the transition to empty nesterhood even more acute for her, right? Because she didn't have a job or a career that she was also focused on. But well, um, let me ask another selfish question in the context of say, because a lot of times stay at home moms lack kind of an identity to move away from being a mom. Did you do anything that helped your wife kind of figure out what she could do with life after kind of being the caretaker of the kids? Was that something you had to navigate or even help her understand or even things that maybe you just had to make sure you kept the hands off and just kind of let her and have that space to and permission and in, in a lot of ways to go out there and figure out and design kind of who you could be. Yeah, I think it's a great, great thought. And fortunately, she didn't lean on me for her advice, but she knew she needed something. So she came up with two really great part-time jobs. She works two days a week at our church, another day for another administrative organization. So that's really helped her make the transition. And, you know, look, I, I should say also, she never stopped being a mom, right? She talks to each of our three kids every day. And we now have two sons and daughter-in-laws. We have two married kids and she loves them and talks to them every day too. So it's just uh, the way she's a mom has changed, but her role as a mom hasn't changed, if that makes sense. I want to go into another area to highlight because I see this all time with dads and I see it both sides where we don't do it. And then when we do do it, and I see both the, the effects of it, you have a career, you've been growing that career. It's been successful. What I want to maybe ask or maybe even maybe um, acknowledge here, there's a component where you living your life bigger than just say where you could get stuck or where you could just accept life like this is just how life spins around the roundabout. Also gave her permission to do more as well. Like there's a question when I'm always coaching dads, I'll ask him when we go on a vision quest and we start kind of designing their vision, something I'll ask, and we'll figure out who they are. But then I'll ask, who did your wife become? because you asked for more. And that's a component of fatherhood. And we can use this as a pivot into fatherhood, that if we don't actually learn to invite life into our life, we don't at least teach it with our kids and give them a model. But then we also don't give the space and capacity for our spouse. Also, like, there is a component of marriage that like, if we're not inviting life, it almost just all kind of starts whittling away. And you don't really realize how your marriage died. And often the basic stuff that I found within coaching is because at some point the man stopped living and he just started repeating. And I could easily see as I probably tied it there for fatherhood. You can see your daughters learned how to live because how you lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. What came up for me when you were talking about that, Ben, I think it's so important that you and our partners and our kids too have the conversation about what our individual hopes and dreams are. Man, I think we lose touch of that. And I think to your point, when we're so focused on being a dad or so focused on being a provider, 
you know, we sort of charge full speed in that. And we never ask the questions of our wife or our kids. Hey, you know, tell me about you. What are your hopes and dreams? Where do you want to be? You know, those deep conversations get put to the sidelines. And without having those regularly and being seriously interested in it, we lose a lot of that life. We really do. So that's a great thought. So let's take it to kids. As your kids were growing up, was there a moment that you kind of had an awareness, like I'm actually maybe need to guide my kids into their life versus like the norm where you kind of just keep them alive, which is like, I would say almost the general dad mind. If I were to generalize it, that there's just my general responsibility is to provide, keep them and don't necessarily worry about their emotions, outsource it to your spouse. But there is a component of fatherhood that's much lower in the basement of the journey that you are an example and you are also the guide doing that. So I'm quite curious, what was that beginning journey like for you? Yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, I, I, I am a, I'm a deep, I'm a Christian, right? So, and that's in faith is a big part of my life. So I think a lot of my thoughts around fatherhood do come from that faith. And look, you know, the Christian faith is a lot like some of the other values and other religious systems. A lot of these things haven't been created from scratch. It's just deep seated wisdom and deep seated um, values that have been passed through generations. But I do believe, and I've always believed that my primary role in this life was to be a father. And with that, for me, came all those responsibilities about passing along these values, teaching my kids, you know, giving them a, a roadmap to a better life, rather than just checking the boxes and making sure they have food and water, so to speak. So I can't, I can't point to a, a, a a time where that became real to me. It's just always been that way. And that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about, about dads and the impact they can or cannot have on their kids. Well, let's go to an area. I'm interested to see how this played out for you. Like the one area for me in my mindset that to what we're, most people are missing and most kids are missing is width. We just have a very narrow view of how life works. And it's usually about three lanes at best, one lane if you're really poor, and we just see it as this three lane road and we only get to pick one of these three and that's it. But there's a so million lanes wide if you truly dive into it and explore it, which we were talking about like just going the opposite way, not getting buried in a career before we record as well. So I'm curious, how did you help your kids have a wider view of the world? Was it through experiences? Was it trips? Was it just conversations? Was it volunteer work? What was some of the things you did to really help expose the width and also the depth of how the world works? Yeah, no, great start. I, you know, I would start with mindset with that. You know, a verse, of course, from Jesus, of course, is, you know, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open for you. And I think the challenge as dads is to be able to impart that vision to your children, like essentially saying, look, you can be whatever it is you want to be and help them pull on that thread because that's a huge conversation they can have in their life and talking about width, which is a great analogy. If you can mentally open their minds and allow them to discover what path that they want to go down and understand also that those paths are limitless and granted, look, it's going to take more work for some people than others, but man, the breadth and the opportunity that you can uncover for your children and open their eyes to is immense. So I'd start with mindset and what a great thing as a father you can open your children's eyes to, right? And even just to bring it full circle, you can't help them open their eyes until your eyes are open. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a very good point. Which almost really? makes like us choosing to invite life where how high can we climb? Because if we don't believe in ourselves, we can't, we're just going to pass on the curse of disbelief. And we're almost going to create a generational trauma with it that is just going to be this thing of, mediocre people in our family that never really realize that they have the potential to do anything. And the, the invitation and the way you said being a father, like you felt called to it, like there's two components that I've learned through this journey is that you one realize like you're wired for fatherhood if you lean into it. But the second one is having a strong relationship to the first father. So it's almost like when you realize that we're all brothers and that mm -hmm. we all have this relationship with God, whether you had a bad father or not, that relationship allows you then to model who you are and also almost just kind of like invited to the surface. Like as you journey on your journey on the inside, that will come out on the outside and that will get more connected with who you could be as a dad and give you the courage and wisdom to actually try to help lead your family 
through their life and help get them to their best life and maybe something that you never had and change it forever. No, I think that's a great thought. Ben, another thing, and, and one of the reasons I value what you do so much is you're creating a community where dads can lean on each other and share best practices and ideas. Because to your point, you know, a lot of, a lot of dads grew up in a hard way. They didn't have caring fathers. They didn't have fathers that believed, that believed in, in them as children. And man, the generational curses that could come from that will just be perpetual unless you can interrupt that. And that's what you're doing. And that's why I value this conversation so much. And that's why I'm hopeful that books like mine and communities like yours can give dads tool sets where they can interrupt that and change the outcomes for their own children and then their children's children and their children's children's children. I mean, it's just endless what we can do. Did you say you had all daughters? Nope. We got two daughters and then one son. Interesting. Let's park with the the girls for a minute because- for the girls, I think the other part of fatherhood that we don't really understand is we become the model of masculine love that they first understand and appreciate mm-hmm. and look for. So I'm curious, where did how did that show up in your ability to raise your daughters? And it sounds like they ended up right where it was supposed to. But I'm curious, like, what were some of the small things that you made sure that you did to kind of keep that alignment where it needed to be? You know, I think it starts, Ben, with the way I treat my, my wife. Right. And I think because kids, as you know, man, kids watch every single thing. They read every innuendo. They hear every word and they observe everything. And my belief is that the way I loved my wife, the way I treated her with respect, the way I opened the door for her always, the way I did, you know, sent her flowers and notes, they absorb that. And I think my daughters, uh, would believe that, hey, I am valuable. And as I also tell them, yes, you're beautiful. And I affirm them. They watched how I treated my wife. And I think that's huge. So I think for all the dads, that's where it starts, is how do we, we treat our wives or our significant others, man? Because the kids are watching. And that will be in, that will, they'll feel that and they'll ingest that. And they'll become their own self-belief that they're worthy. I want to highlight and make sure everybody notices the full circle moment that just happened with what Alan said is we started the conversation with how did you make sure you didn't end up as an empty nesters that no longer knew each other and you just validated that the pursuit of making sure that that priority is number one over all the other priorities then circle back and allowed them to accept and understand what this whole thing could look like and then to go out there and find it in the world for themselves I think that was uh, perfect we couldn't have designed it any better if we were trying to have this as scripted as how this full circle of love begins and and kids come from the love of you and your wife. And then modeling it from the very beginning allows it to flow downward versus trying to create some weird spiral or weird relationship with it and just making it more complicated. And then life gets harder when you get divorced and it doesn't have any end in sight sometimes when you're going through those things. So really appreciate that uh, full circle moment there. Yeah, no, Ben, I think, you know, what we're talking about now is the importance of the family unit in a way. And um, we, we could get down a rabbit hole and spend hours on it. But uh, man, the, it, it is the most important part of our civilization, I believe, is the family unit. You can see that it's destruction, or at least it's the, the negative impact that family has had, what that does to society, man. It's, it's horrific. You can point to moments in history. I know you, like me, are a history buff. You can see where societies have tried to interrupt the family for their own purposes. Think about Nazi Germany and the Hitler youth and think about the devastation, the carnage that came from that. So one of the roles in my view of a father is to make sure that that family unit is impenetrable, that it is a shield and a wall and there's safety and love. I mean, doing what you just talked about, that's everything in my mind. So let's pivot to your son. How old is your son? He is 25. Is is he also married? It sounds like if I do my math correctly. I had two kids married off last year. That was a busy year, especially during uh, all the craziness of the world. That was a big year, man. And uh, yeah, no, my son's great. He lives in Salt Lake City with his At least only one was a girl. Otherwise, it would have been a double hit to your pocketbook. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still recovering, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. If you would have had a double one, you would be, uh, we're, we're going to just go and uh, slow down for a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So when you think of the same concept with your son, what were some of the things that you found most valuable in his journey to figure out who he could be and what kind of questions he could ask and who he could become? I think it's similar, man. I think it starts also with the way that the husband and wife, their interaction, you know, he clearly observed me and how I treated my wife. And so his view of how women are to be treated, I think is still, still with him. I think, you know, the qualities of respect and the qualities of, you know, what we value and what we think are important and the things that drive a man, which are different than what drive a woman, you know, that those were observed over his youth. And I think us just as models, um, these kids watch us and it's even more acute for us of son or a man in making sure that uh, they see quality values in uh, when they're, when they're kids. Did you ever do any rites of initiation or anything at different ages? No, we really didn't. We, we did a lot of traveling and we, we spent a lot of time together. And as you know, from this book, you know, a lot of these letters that I wrote to them uh, every month over the course of their teenage years, and they're just, they just were born from our experiences together. So a lot of times I would pull on a thread of something we experienced to try to, you know, dig out some learning or help them think about it differently. And I found those to be really valuable moments for them. They're just good teaching moments that they would tell you themselves, um, you know, were impactful. And I can imagine the therapy process that goes through writing that book. I'm curious, as you wrote these letters and then compiled it into a book, was there like a big thesis statement that kind of came together that reflected about your life that maybe you didn't see before until you went through the exercise? No, it's an interesting question. I get, I get asked that a good bit, by the way, too, Ben. You know, I think if you read this book, you'll see a lot about who I was during the writing process. And, you know, we all evolve. We all grow as, hu as humans and as men. And I think uh, you'll see in this book that I was, I'm a striver, right? I'm really goal-oriented. I'm a big believer in that what we see, we can achieve. I'm a big believer in all that sort of stuff. So a lot of the themes of this letter, the, the books, and a lot of the themes of each letter is about that. So, you know, that's a big part of it. You know, I get asked too, how have you changed? I think, um, you know, I've definitely mellowed in my, and now that I'm, I'm a little bit more mature and I'm sort of less concerned about hitting every goal I laid out and more concerned about the quality of my life and the quality of experiences that we have. But it'd be interesting if we get, if I get a letters from a grandfather out there, <laughs> how that'll change. Yeah. And I'd be interested, like the other time capsule moment of, when they're reflecting say 20 years from now, or when they have kids as well, and they realize the wisdom baked in there that you don't really appreciate parenting wisdom until you're in the, in the thick of it. And, the, or even those moments like, Oh, this is what dad's been talking about. Like it just, some stuff just doesn't sink in. Cause you think like, oh, I can't be that bad. And then you have screaming toddlers or you have the house burning down with emotions and you feel overwhelmed. And it's just that moment where you're like, you realize the, the wisdom that can come from dad as well. Yeah, no, I think that's right. That's, that's why I think, you know, dad should write this stuff down. Even if you don't write your own letters to kids, just memorializing it, even journaling is super helpful. It really is. Cause you're sort of bucketing stuff and you're processing your emotions on paper. Um, Cause that invariably helps you to get better. There was a few episodes ago, we had a, a, I can't remember the guy's name, but he has an app called the Legacy app, which essentially is a digital diary of videos and audio memos and written word that then you can gift your kids when they're 18 is kind of like this memorial of wisdom and memories and thoughts and something just kind of like to gift them that like I was noticing even when you didn't and those moments of validation that can come that from. I haven't really dove into it yet, but it's been baked into the back of my head of something of like, how do I keep getting into these ideas and how do I keep documenting? And there's been a conversation, especially tying it to military dads. I've talked about this a lot if you're a longtime listener, of creating a pathway through your kids to be able to tap into your wisdom. Because if you're an active military dad, there's a chance in some weird world where you don't come home that night. Yeah. And and it happens in the real world as well, but as military dad, it's something that you you welcome every day Thank in the back of your head and you're like, it, it could happen. 
is creating a place or a, a, a thought or a tool to allow them to access your wisdom. And I often describe them as anchor memories, like creating a place that you would go and where you would just be really in touch with dad and his conversations that when he's no longer here, you could go and like ask a question like, what would dad do right now? And I think in your case that your book will be that like, they'll be able to go back and touch your thoughts and your wisdom well past your time here. And it'll almost maybe be something that is passed down of understanding who, who you were and how you lived and letting those lessons not be something that someone has to learn the eighth time around that. I mean, imagine if you think of how many times it took, took you to get to the lesson that you wanted to write in a letter and how many times in the future that will go from 10 to eight to four to three to two. And imagine if you can start applying lessons a lot quicker from ages one to two, which I mean, generally you don't really start figuring out how to parent properly until the third one. So if you can get that age down further, you're essentially even going to create a stronger, more impactful child because the learning lesson, the learning curve is going to be that much shorter. And everyone in your family is going to know this because from you. Well, I mean, yeah, look, this is parenting is a hard job, right? It really, really is. But you mentioned two things there, which uh, really resonate. One is about legacy. And uh, that gentleman you mentioned with the legacy app, I mean, that's an awesome thought because as humans, that's what we desire. We want to we want to be sustained a little bit longer than beyond the grave, right? And so creating a legacy, especially with your, within your own family, is a super thing to think about as a dad. And then, uh, yeah, the second piece is, look, this is, I think kids, kids understand that we're going to make mistakes, right? This is not, it's a hard job being a dad. We're going to have a lot of pressures. But what they want more than anything, man, is they just want effort, right? They want to see that you're really working at it you're trying, that you're striving to get better, man. They feel that and they see that. And I got to tell you, they absolutely appreciate it. So your point about creating a space or creating a process within your family where you're really working on that, those kids know that and they love you for it. And uh, when they're younger, they may not fully appreciate it, but when they're at your age and when you become colleagues and you both have had kids and then you can just start comparing notes, I think that's really like a whole new uh, frontier of where your relationship even deepens more, especially if you've been working on these legacy ideas, because then you're not just interaction, hanging around, playing with the kids on the floor. Like you're sharing the wisdom and you're passing it down in a way that most people in the world don't do these days, even though uh -huh. it's the one thing that kind of kept people alive for millions of years is passing down how to survive. We've just kind of like put that to the side because survival is pretty easy if you got a credit card. And the wisdom that goes beyond credit cards is what we've lost. Yeah, that's really well said, man. It really is. And, you know, especially for military dads, like, they, you know, they, I'm, I was blessed with being home every night for dinner, right? But in the community that you're a part of, man, a lot of these dads don't have that opportunity, man. So creating those touch points that, uh, are, uh, that can be sustained for longer periods of time away, that's a huge thing to think about. I'm interested to get your perspective on two questions. What was the hardest letter to write? And what was the, your favorite letter to write? Uh, I'll tackle the, the, I guess the, the second question first. I think my favorite was, uh, I'll share it with you, man. I was, uh, I'm a sail. I'm a sailor, right? I love to sail and Chicago, as you know, sits on Lake Michigan, right? And, Lake Michigan can, can be an evil body of water. And uh, I was bringing a good sized boat across from the Michigan side over to the Illinois side of the lake. It was about a 65 mile transit in on the 1st of May. And on the 1st of May, the, the water temperature in Lake Michigan, as you know, is about mm, 37, 38 degrees. And we just got crushed by a, I would call it an early spring, late winter type blow. And we had 12 foot waves and it was blowing 40 plus knots and all kinds of hell was breaking loose. But yeah, you know, we had a really good boat with a really good crew and great electronics. So we set that compass, the electronic compass, exactly where we wanted to go. We locked in the autopilot and no matter what happened with all those wind and waves, we were just locked in. We knew we were going to get where we were going to go, going to go. And so as I wrote part of that letter down below in that tossing boat, 
I was thinking about how the winds and waves of life, you know, just crush us all the time. But if we're locked in on something, you know, we'll for sure get to where we want to go. And I think that that's a great lesson to our kids to just ignore the noise, focus on your discipline and your passion, focus on what you want to get, where you want to go. And you're going to get there. So that's probably one of my favorite ones. There are so many extra analogies that I could add to that because the compass represents almost the direction towards the vision, which we kicked off this episode with the if by you learning your life, by you knowing where you're headed and not just some roundabout that you can't break free from and trusting that vision that will get you and create who you're meant to be. And there's another idea that I describe with vision that I always like to describe it in the context of like a planet, that the larger the planet or the vision, the larger the gravity that that planet will have. And if you have a really big, clear vision, the gravity will pull you towards it. In this case, it wasn't gravity that was guiding your compass. It was a magnetism. Magnetism comes from partially with the idea of gravity. So like knowing and trusting that those things are coming from something really big, like the core of the earth and trusting it, like that is something, I mean, as I even say it out loud, think of how many kids these days don't trust how to take a step every single day and how many kind of live in fear of living each day to even what they could do, not even just some big idea. How do you get up? do some good things and live for today. Like today, there's a whole group of people out there that have no trust in that ability. And most of all ways, it comes from a lack of a good father in those cases that they didn't have someone or they had parents that made them fear kind of that idea and that I couldn't be those things. So, I mean, there are so many analogies that were baked into there. My mind just started racing. Yeah, no, it's so true. And you just touched on something that makes me think of the letters that were tougher for me to write. And invariably they, they're about time, which is what you talked about. And man, we are, we're here on this earth for a second. And it's a one take deal, man. And we don't get any redos on it. So when I think about the impact of that and our kids grow so fast. And so, um, you know, it's just that using that time wisely, I'll call it investing time and recognizing that the time we have is so fleeting. And trying as a dad to really focus on that. Look, we're as dads, we've got so many things that are on our shoulders. We've got to be providers, man. We've we've got responsibilities, we've got bills to pay, we've got jobs to do, we've got kids to raise, but and it's all moving so quickly. But to be able to capture those moments with our kids, to pass along that wisdom, to create that time and space. Those are the most important things I think we can do. So letters that focus on time for me were the toughest because they, they made me realize how fleeting it is. Does that make sense? Wholeheartedly. And I think the hardest part about time, especially for me, is generally no matter how good of a dad, and especially I feel like the more intentional as a father you become, the more dad guilt you almost carry. Because mm, then you start yeah. questioning when you weren't fully awake. Or when you were yeah. awake, but you weren't like really awake. And so, I mean, as much as I've learned about fatherhood in the last four years of doing this, I feel like I wasn't a bad father back then, but I didn't realize how much better I could do. And I think every time I think about time, it's almost, it creates like an, an internal anxiety of, well, I have to make sure I do everything. Like, especially for summer, especially within Corona now for the summer yeah. months, like I am constantly like, even in living in Wisconsin here, like we've got to get as much summer packed in as we can. And I work from home. So like the opportunity is even greater. So it's not like I have to go to work for eight hours a day. It's like, how can we make the most out of the day? Because come winter, I'm just going to wish for another summer day. And if I wasted it doing nothing, I'm going to be like, oh, that was a wasted day. And then I got to wait for it to come around. So it just kind of is heightened my dad guilt of not doing enough back then. But then as I try to fix that and correct it, it's trying to make sure I live within my normal sanity measure of where I could get, but it's still so hard trying to figure out and balance that feeling of once, you know, well, how do you know when it's enough? Yeah. That's it, so it, 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 the more, the more, you know, the harder it, it's, I'm sure is even as like person in, in the business world that it's like, you can know a lot of different stuff, but how do you know when you've worked on the business enough? And just cause you know, doesn't mean you can fix everything. And just cause you know, doesn't mean every problem can be fixed. And, some things you just got to let go. It's a interesting dichotomy as you grow as a father, when you have to 
reconcile where you were, but then get excited about where you could go and then let go of what maybe wasn't perfect in the moment. Yeah, that's really, and you know, when you, when you're talking about that, I was thinking about regrets, right? Um, how do you minimize those regrets? Um, and not let them be weird. boat anchors. Like how yeah. do you not let them be that weight that kind of slows you down consciously of, of missed opportunities? Yeah. And that's something that back to your community that you've built, uh, that's something that really guys should be talking about with each other because they can be anchors. That's a great word. And we got to learn from each regret that we get seared into us. And so we don't see, see stumble down that path again. And you're right. And be able to let ourselves off the hook for them too. So we can move forward. That's a big thought. Was there anything, as I said it, that came up for you as something that maybe you struggled as a regret as you huh. grew and become a father? Yeah, it, it typically it's back to about time. It's that time I miss with my kids, right? It's that time where I chose to work the extra few hours or the time I chose to miss an event because of a client or business engagement. Man, I'll never get that back. Just never. And uh, it might a few put a few more dollars in my pocket. And guys tend to defend that. Dads tend to defend that decision sometimes by saying, well, hey, the best way I can be a provider for my kid is by being financially you know, responsible. And that's easy to swallow at the time. But now as an empty nester, when I look back, man, I don't need another $5 in the bank or $10 in the bank. What I want more than anything is time with my 12-year-old who's now 19 and I'll never get that back. So yeah, for sure. Um, Definitely. Or even how many times do you wish like we could go back and your son be 10 and throw a football around or something? And... Yeah, every day. Yeah, every day. And that's just, yeah, and you know, for sure. I haven't really considered, maybe I have, and I just never went down the rabbit hole, but I've, it's almost, this is probably what drives grandparents in general to be really good grandparents and really engaging in to say hell with all the other stuff. Usually they're almost really good at just saying the hell with all the world around it and focusing on like spoiling, being connected, saying yes to coming over more often than maybe you want being your parents. But it's that <laughs> kind of like circle of they realize the gaps they made and it's that second chance to fill the holes where maybe they didn't even know what they were missing, but it's that second chance to level out the playing field and level out that maybe let go of some of those boat anchors too. Maybe it's also just kind of a lethargic um, process to, to grow of being a grandfather as well. Could be. I hope you and I both get that chance someday, right? Me too. It's something that I think about. Sometimes it comes with conscience of my health. And I remember early on in maybe six years ago, I remember a thought that popped in. It's like, who am I to make decisions? Like maybe not taking care of my health or losing weight or eating right. And to take away the time away from me being grandfather. Like I feel like it would be a very selfish exercise for me to die at 60 and my kids have to figure it out on their own and to not mm. have the benefit of me being there and have it 100% my fault. Like that thought was something that before I even knew how to work through my thoughts was a kind of a parallelizing thought, but it made me realize of like, I don't have a right to take that time away. And so I need to make sure I focus on the now so that that downtime in the future can happen and that I'm here as long as I need to be and, and can be and to make those memories. 100%, 100%, yeah. Well, as we go through some big questions here, I want to wrap up with one thought and it's gonna be a hard one, I think for you. It's an easy question, but it's a hard question. Is if you think out of all the lessons you've got going on in your journey as a dad, you're at the end of the road and I'm going to make, I'm going to even put a, uh, a filter on it that try to come up with something that's not time-based. What is that piece of advice? Actually, I'll get, I'll get specific. What does that dad, that corporate minded dad that's focused on climbing the corporate ladder, who is told to go climb the corporate ladder and he's selling himself a line of bullshit that he's buying double every day of the week. What are some of like the really the truth words that that man needs to hear to break free? Because you have it from both sides. You have you you see what men do when they climb, and you can see why they climb. But you also see the blinders that those men. Because I've seen them where you could tell them time matters. You could tell them they're going to regret it when they're eighteen, but they keep buying that bullshit. So I'm curious, what would be some of those best words that you think that would crack that open and let that dad hear? 
it's not going to work that way. Gosh, I think if you and I could solve for that, um, we could change the world. I mean, it's that, look, this is so embedded in human nature. There's a couple of things that goes into it. One, I would call it, it's a scarcity mentality, right? Where nothing's ever enough, right? And Jesus talks about this, man. We, we just, we get on these treadmills of life and we just focus on accumulating, 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 and nothing's enough. And it's like, Interrupting that is, is almost impossible. It's part of our human nature. Another thing in there is this, you know, as a striver, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, guys typically are really goal oriented, right? And so we're going to fight for whatever it is we put in front of us. So you combine those two things where nothing's ever enough and you are fighting for what we want relentlessly and sometimes our families, to your point, get left behind. They just do, or they get in the back seat of that bus. So I wish I could solve for that. I think I'm trying to in a small way with just conversations like this, as you are doing. But I think more than anything is just repeating this mantra to people like, hey, um, you know, this is your nature. It ain't necessarily a good thing. You might want to think about your family first, but I think if we can just drip, drip, drip on people, it might make a difference. At least it'll take the sting out of it. You know, I didn't have it. I didn't have it when I asked your question, but you gave me some insights into three words that I just recently learned at a men's retreat I was at in Orlando this past weekend. And this man had a tattoo on his arm and he didn't always have it there. He learned it through his own story. And he's got a crazy story. When he was like 10 years old, he got hit by a truck and his arm was like flung 10 feet away from his body and had to get reattached. So like a crazy story and how much stuff you could think about going through that. And he has yeah. these three words tattooed, trust, surrender, and breathe. And trust, as I think of this context, of this crazy man that's climbing the corporate ladder, trust, nothing you do at this place is going to matter after you're gone. Mm -hmm. And trust that it's going to be okay surrender that you have you have no control over anything you do and breathe and enjoy what you have right now like those three words i don't know whether they would crack the nut but it's the surrender part like because i feel like most of those men climbing the corporate ladder they're fighting and they're fighting every day but the idea of surrendering is the idea that you're weak and that you're not enough and the probably the crux of our humanity or the maybe the curse of adam going back is that this idea that we are enough we only we never needed to fight and only thing we need to surrender is what the beauty we have around us at every day and it's almost our desire maybe to to fill that void that we're always messing up with i don't know if psychologically it goes back to the adam uh, the fall of adam but there's probably a component of that where we're always trying to make better or try to prove that we're enough when God's only ever asked us to surrender and just be you with what you've got. That's a beautiful thought, man. That hits my Christian faith square in the middle. You're right. I mean, it's interesting, you know, you can tell where a guy's head is. If you ask him, Hey man, you know, tell me about yourself. And he immediately goes into, well, it's my career or whatever it is. You learn so much. But the reality is the only real, the only answer we need, at least for me as a Christian is, Hey, I'm a, I'm a beloved child of God. Because that, what, that's surrender right there. It's just recognizing that we are enough as who we are. So, you know, you hit on a really big idea, Ben. I think we all would be better if we could embrace that for sure. And there was, there's just, um, it's a downside of, say, even capitalism is that we're always pursuing more. We want to build, we want to represent, but... And this is kind of why I asked you the question about before we hit record. I mean, oh, actually, we actually talked about it already about what your thesis was out of that book. I've learned that my thesis was that most men come go into world and they're told to go grab a status, a salary, a car, a parking spot, a size of a building, the floor of the building, the view. And they're told that that's where you should go to feel home as a man. And that you should, that's your purpose is to go into there and claim those things. And then those things will create a home back home and that you buy a house and then a home will just happen naturally. But like I said, my thesis is we've been told to go look there, but actually home is an inside job that you can't actually even have a house that becomes a home if you're not home on the inside. 
And it was about maybe a year and a half ago, someone gave me a story of Jesus that he talks about building your house on a rock. And that foundation is what everything builds from it. And that's not a foundation of a house. That's the foundation of your soul. And if you have a weak foundation of your soul, it's going to be with popsicle sticks. And every time you get to the third story, it's always going to collapse. And if you're looking for a hundred story building, it starts with digging down 10 stories deep and making sure you hit bedrock before you ever decide to go up. That's a great thought, man. I can't even add to that. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, the only way to build that bedrock is through suffering and pain. Right. Um, and we all have to go through that and how we respond to that and how we view it. Um, I, I, one more thing on this. I wrote a, a, a piece on gratitude, which is a lot what you're talking about. You know, when we go through those dark periods, just embracing it, being present with it, being grateful for it, because it is building our character and building that foundation and bedrock like you talked about. That's a huge mindset shift, too, that would really help us all, I think. One of the books that I love, and if you're a longtime listener, you will know that this book has been uh, impact. And I've told this story many times is episode 93, Becoming a King by Morgan Schneider. And he tells a story about Proverbs 14, 4, which is the only Proverbs that I've ever memorized because it has the most potential to change your life. And it's the one that's impacted me the most. And it has to do with oxen and where there's oxen, there's life. And where there's no oxen, there is no life. And on the interview, he's like, let me loosely translate that for you. It takes a lot of shit to make good soil and great soil bears great fruit. The fruits of your soil, the foundation that you build your house on has to be a rich soil. You don't get rich soil to, ch to change with growth smith unless you put fertilizer on it. And it's a shit of your life that will lead the best harvest. And that's the illusion that men go off into the status because that status will hide the pain. If someone thinks we're a CEO, how well, are they going to think that they're having a bad day, that that illusion shouldn't exist because they make millions of dollars? Million dollar people are people that make millions just have million dollar problems. They have the same kind of problems that people that make 20,000 a year. We just have different kind of problems. But it's that illusion that the pain doesn't have purpose. And to me, the, the, the journey of every dad kind of begins with and this idea of how your wisdom can be passed down is helping them understand how their pain has purpose. And when a man finds purpose in his pain, there's no, I mean, this podcast exists because of my pain. And I mean, you can begin to move mountains if you understand what that purpose is. For sure. And then you've embraced it. That's so telling, man. And uh, the good you're doing because you've embraced it is huge. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that compliment. And I also really appreciate this entire interview. These are the kind of conversations that I could go on forever. If people want to get in touch with you and get in touch with buying your book or learn any more about the work that you're up to with Letters from Your Father, where can they go to find you, Alan? A couple of places. One, I'm on all the socials at Alan, that's A-L-L-E-N, in Chicago. And then for the book, yeah, if you just search my title, which is Letters from a Father, and the author's name, Alan Carter, It'll pop up on Amazon and all the other booksellers. And I will say too, lastly, Ben, that all proceeds of this go to charity. Um, I've got no interest in this monetarily. So uh, if anybody thinks it's helpful, they'll be doing good if they buy it. And thank you. Again, Alan, thank you for that. And I'll include all of those links in the social. And you did say you're going to be moving to Georgia, which your domain name is going to instantly fall apart the moment you decide to make that pivot. <laughs> Purposely, you're going to be like, that was only a good idea then. And I really had no idea. I, I permanently uh, set myself up for a future problem that I didn't know I was really going to have. Well, Chicago is where our business is. So we'll always have a home there. Uh, but I am looking to spend more time in the mountains down here. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, Alan, thank you again for sharing your time today. And I look forward to uh, talking the next time because I'm positive this is the beginning of our friendship. Thank you, Ben. It's a blessing to be with you. I hope this episode gave you exactly what you needed this week to be a better dad, to be a better father, to be more intentional, and to hopefully dream bigger than even who you originally thought the kind of dad you wanted to be tomorrow. And hopefully gave you the courage to step into that today and every day in the future. Alan Cutter's message really hit home for me. And in a way, we were wrapped up towards the end where we were talking about how do we break the cycle of that man, that dad, that just sees his world, his role as one-dimensional. And those three words, trust, breathe, and surrender, those words really hit home for me as a process to break those cycles, to understand how we can go through life and be different, how we can understand that this is the only moment that matters. Even just in the last 48 hours, there's been several moments where I'm just overwhelmed, feeling anxious, 
But you know what? I often keep telling myself, this is just what life looks like. It's okay to be anxious right now. It's okay to feel a little bit of lack of control. It can, it's okay to feel like I need a break. It's okay to feel tired. But in those moments, I just remember like, this is just what life looks like. It's going to be different in a few minutes. It's going to be different in 10 minutes. If fatherhood should teach you one thing, nothing is permanent. One meltdown 10 minutes later could be something different. It's always evolving. And it's when we get make it sticky and we hold on to it, when we prevent ourselves from riding through it, then, only then, do we get that extra feeling. Do we get that presence? Do we get that mindset that allows us to focus on the here and the now? Make sure you check out his book. Again, the link is down in the show notes to support the podcast. You don't pay anything more, but Amazon does give us a support fee for referring you to Amazon. So appreciate all of that support. If you're looking for more content, if you're like, these conversations are really good on Monday, and maybe you've been listening and you've caught some up of the backlog and you checked out some of those Fatherhood Fridays and you're like, what happened to them? Well, came down to it essentially, it was just too much content to create. And I already was doing a five-day week daily podcast that I started last April. So if you want more information, if you want more bite-sized pieces, the wisdom I've taken out from doing 156 of these episodes, over 250 episodes total if you count Fatherhood Fridays, and now almost 250 episodes on Business of Fatherhood, Business of Fatherhood is designed to give you five minutes, five to 10 minutes, sometimes even shorter, a mindset shift for that day. It's five days a week to give you that just that boost, that shift, that few degree course correction that can mean every a little bit of difference when you walk through that door. So make sure you check out the Business of Fatherhood. It's available everywhere that you can listen and download your podcast. I am Ben Cloy. I am your host, military veteran dad. I am the host of Business of Fatherhood. I am here to help you become a better dad. And I am excited for you to be here as well. And until next time, we'll talk again on Monday. Mm-hmm.